The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Welcome to What Catholics Believe. This is a special edition here, uh, just to, to report on an event that took place in the Vatican on October 13th. Last October 13th was the 99th anniversary of Our Lady's appearance at Fatima to the three children, and the occasion in which she gave us the great miracle of the sun as a sign of the truth of what she uh, had said of her the honesty and the fact of her appearances to the children there. This miracle of the sun was witnessed by upwards to 70,000, some say as many as 100,000 people um, within miles of Fatima. And uh, so there's a great deal of testimony. In fact, it was reported in the press around the world in 1917, October 13th. Now, on October 13th, in this uh, year, 2016, Francis did not have a commemoration of Fatima, Our Lady's appearances at Fatima, Our Lady's words at Fatima. No, he had a special celebration of Lutheranism, as it turns out. LifeSite News reported on this. It was a very interesting, an excellent article, in fact, in LifeSiteNews.com that talks about this event. In fact, uh, this was reported Tuesday, October 25th in this year, 2016, in LifeSite News. And so I thought it would be worth reading this article and uh, intend to do so. The article is entitled, A Statue of Luther in the Vatican and a New Papal Definition of Lukewarm. Pope Francis will travel to Lund, Sweden next week to assist in the launch of a year-long commemoration of the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther's nailing of his 95 theses to the door of the Castle Church of Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517. In a lead-up event at the Vatican on October 13th, the Pope received a group of 1,000 Lutherans and Catholics from Germany in the Vatican's Paul VI Hall, and addressed them from the stage where a statue of Luther was erected. The sight came as a shock to many Catholics because Luther was excommunicated and his theses rejected by Pope Leo X in 1520. The split he caused in Christianity remains as one of the most damaging in the Church's 2,000-year history. At the meeting, Francis reinforced his admonition from earlier this month against converting people. Weeks after saying it is a, quote, very grave sin against ecumenism, unquote, for Catholics to try to convert Orthodox Christians, Pope Francis told the pilgrims, quote, it is not licit to convince non-Christians of your faith. So having said a few weeks before Francis, uh, that it was, not, it was a grave sin, he said, to try to convert what he called Orthodox Christians. He's talking about the Greek and the Russian Orthodox churches. To convert members of the Greek and Orthodox churches with a capital O there, uh, that would be a grave sin. Here he says, it's not licit, meaning legal, not permitted, meaning sinful, to convince non-Christians of your faith. In that meeting, the Pope also offered a novel definition of lukewarm, which according to Pope Francis is when Christians are keen to defend Christianity in the West, on the one hand, but on the other are averse to refugees and other religions. So if we can take this 
uh, at its face value, Francis has said that being lukewarm means that you want to defend your own religion and your faith in Christ, but that that doesn't translate into being zealous or fervent in your faith, that you want to be faithful to Christ and, and stand out for that faith, if at the same time you're not open to other religions, if you're averse to refugees and other religions. This is a strange, as they say here, novel definition of the word lukewarm. And they go on to say here, the word lukewarm has significant meaning to Christians because of the words of Christ revealed in St. John's book, well, they call it here the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Catholics know it to be the book of the Apocalypse. And this is quoted, I know your works, I know that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot. But because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, in the book of the Apocalypse, it is our Lord speaking here to St. John the Apostle. And basically what he says is that those who are lukewarm about him and their faith in him and their hope and love for him actually are sickening. The effect to our Lord is as though it, it makes him feel ill. And he rejects them. He vomits them out of his mouth. Very graphic, very graphic statement. But for Francis to use the, the word lukewarm there in that sense is amazing. It is not only novel, it is actually absurd to say that if your zeal for your faith in Christ means you, you will defend the church the, the, uh, the Catholic Church, but you're not open to other religions, then you're lukewarm. Now, does that make any sense? No, but then so much of what Francis says makes no sense at all. I mean, here's a man who accused traditional Catholics of being Pelagians, and yet he turns around and says that you don't even have to have faith to save your soul. Well, Pelagius was the... 5th century British monk who taught that you can save your soul by your own efforts and you don't need any supernatural grace to do it. So Francis in the very act of essentially going way beyond anything what the condemned heresy of Pelagius actually said accuses traditional Catholics who are definitely not Pelagians and condemn Pelagian of being new Pelagians. But again, Either he doesn't know what he's talking about, and his ignorance is absolutely abysmal, or, or he's simply an a, a, a arch enemy of the Catholic faith and an arch enemy of Jesus Christ, or both. But the article in LifeSite News goes on. The common interpretation of the verses here in the Book of Revelation, as they call it, was to condemn the practice of picking and choosing among Christ's teachings rather than holding on to all of them. As the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says, half-hearted commitment to the faith is nauseating to Christ. In answer to a question about what he likes about the, the Lutheran Church, Francis said, I really like good Lutherans, Lutherans who really practice their faith in Jesus Christ. What I don't like are lukewarm Catholics and lukewarm Lutherans. Italian daily La Stampa, Vatican Insider, quotes the Pope as saying, it's a contradiction when Christians are keen to defend Christianity in the West on the one hand, but on the other are averse to refugees and other religions. The Pope's application of Christ's strong condemnation to those who would be averse to other religions is perhaps a warning to those who would object to his coming praise for Luther, scheduled for October 31st. Swedish Catholic professor Clemens Kavelin points out in an essay on the upcoming celebration <coughs> with Pope Francis in Lund that the common prayer service to be used has a very positive view of Luther. The text, this is what the Swedish 
Catholic professor, Clemens Kavelin, is saying now, the text paints a picture of Luther as a religious hero who found the way to a more true form of Catholicism. I guess that's Lutheranism, I suppose. Kavelin notes that in the liturgi liturgical guide, the common prayer, a section called Thanksgiving is intended to express, quote, our mutual joy for the gifts received and rediscovered in various ways through the renewal in impulses of the Reformation. After the prayer of thanksgiving, the whole assembly joins in singing thanks for and praise of God's work. The ecumenical journey enables Lutherans and Catholics to appreciate together Martin Luther's insight into and spiritual experience of the gospel of the righteousness of God, which is also God's mercy, the text says. And the section concludes with the following prayer of gratitude. Notice what they're giving thanks for here. Thanks be to you, O God, for the many guiding theological and spiritual insights that we have all received through the Reformation. Thanks be to you for the good transformations and reforms that were set in motion by the Reformation or by struggling with its challenges. Thanks be to you for the proclamation of the gospel that occurred during the Reformation and that since then has strengthened countless people to live lives of faith in Jesus Christ. Amen, they say, Francis will say. Curious, right, that Francis says, I really like... Lutherans who really practice their faith in Jesus Christ. Now, wait a minute. The Lutheran faith in Jesus Christ, as recounted by Luther, is that we're saved by faith alone, which is totally contrary to virtually every page of the Gospel. What happened to our Lord's words, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things I command of you? What happens to our Lord's words, to the, when the woman cries out, Blessed is the womb that bore thee. And our Lord says, Yea, rather blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. What happens to the words of our Lord when in St. Matthew chapter 25 he talks about the sheep and the goats being gathered at the last judgment? And he, our Lord, in judging says, Come ye blessed of my Father and take possession of the kingdom, because when I was hungry you fed me, when I was thirsty you gave me to drink. These are all deeds of charity. Luther says, none of these things are required for salvation. None of these things. Francis has already said that he agrees absolutely with Martin Luther on his teaching on justification, a teaching that is formally condemned as heretical by the Catholic Church. Francis has already said that his church, the Novus Ordo, agrees so much with the Lutheran that they actually signed a common statement of faith on what justification means. Now you might say, well, that's maybe, maybe there's a difference we have to make here. Draw a line, because the Catholic Church believes in not only justification, but sanctification. So maybe Francis was saying, we still disagree on the matter of sanctification, but we can still agree on the Lutheran teaching of justification. It's still heretical. You see, the Lutherans after Luther, don't even believe in sanctification. The Catholic Church teaches that our Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross to bring us a share in the divine life called sanctifying grace. And after our Lord has justified us from sin, he sanctifies the soul. He sanctifies the soul by sanctifying grace. Lutherans do not believe in this. Martin Luther does not believe in sanctifying grace. It is no, there's no room for this very concept in Lutheranism. Why? Because by sin, we are intrinsically corrupt. By sin, according to Luther, we've, in, we've corrupted our nature. And there's no way we can uncorrupt it. And there's no way even that God can uncorrupt human nature. We cannot be justified in the sense that we are just ourselves. Our justification is applied to us externally. The justification of Christ is applied to us. We just remain rotten sinners. He's even stated that even in heaven, the souls of men are just snow-covered dunghills. They're just dumb. And the justification of Christ obtained for us on the cross is just like a cover of a layer of snow. Now, what a rotten 
uh, concept of heaven this is. Okay, a bunch of piles of dung under under a layer of snow. Uh, this does not conjure up thoughts of heaven in my mind, but this is Luther's heaven. But the idea that the soul can actually be sanctified and be holy and pleasing to God by such a thing as sanctifying grace, Luther absolutely re, absolutely rejected that whole concept. So the idea of the sanctification of the human soul, Luther basically rules out as utterly impossible. <clears throat> and even the justification of the soul is a matter of extrinsically applying the merits of Christ to the soul. And uh, the soul is just has a veneer of justice, a justification. Kind of reminds you, actually, of the Gospel, where our Lord talks about the Jews preparing for the some holy day they're celebrating. And they took the, uh, the tombs, probably along the, the brook of Kedron there, uh, that our Lord would cross on the way to Gethsemane, on Holy Thursday night. They would paint them. They would give them a, a, a whitewashing to make them look, look clean and, and new and bright in the sunlight. But as our Lord said, you do that, you paint them, but they're still full of dead men's bones. Well, that's basically there's Luther's concept of the human soul justified by Christ. Still full of dead men's bones, but they've given it a, a, a whitewash. So there is a massive difference there's, between the Catholic teaching on the real justification and sanctification of the human soul. And Luther's saying... The only justification we can have is by our faith that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. We accept that, and that's our justification right there. Pure and simple, we can't go anywhere beyond that. We can't perform good works because every good work we do is corrupted already by selfishness. We can't really resist sin because our nature is so ruined and weakened that it is our pride that would try to make us think we can resist sin, temptation. The three went so far to say if you're tempted to sin and then the thought comes to you that you can and should resist the temptation, realize that your pride telling you that you can and must resist the temptation. And the worst temptation is not the temptation to commit fornication. The worst temptation is not to steal or lie or cheat or even murder. Worse than all of those is the temptation to think that you can resist the temptation. And so his advice? Sin. Commit the sin to humble yourself. Commit the sin to humble yourself to remind you that your justification is not from the fact that you didn't sin, but from the fact that you did sin, but you believe in the merits of Christ who has covered all of that for you. This is sick. And it is not only sick, it is actually totally contrary to the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, who when he healed, or when he saved the woman, caught in adultery, or when he healed those of disease, he would say, go and sin no more, lest something worse befall you. Something worse than being stoned to death? Something worse than leprosy? Yes. Eternal damnation. But our Lord tells him, go and sin no more. That's his command. Luther, go and sin some more. That's his formula. Go and sin some more, but just have confidence that Christ died for you. That's how you're saved. That's a bald-faced lie. That's a complete adulteration and a complete uh, uh, rejection of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Francis says he, he really likes people who, who follow that faith, who follow that belief, that Christ actually taught that. He didn't teach that at all. That's a heresy. It's responsible for the damnation of many souls who find it attractive to think, hey, I can believe and then do what I want. I don't have to follow our Lord's words in the gospel. I don't have to be faithful to him as long as I have faith that he died for me on the cross and accept him as my personal savior. Then my sins don't count. Past, present, or future. Because I'm justified by believing that he died for me on the cross and offered that sacrifice for me. Well, I'm sorry uh, for those who would fall into the trap of that heresiarch, Luther. 
But that's, that's a terrible lie, a terrible deception. And, Luther, and Francis is part of it now. Francis is, is, is not only adheres to it himself, but he is endorsing it. Even the name of Catholicism. How horrible. What a blasphemy that is. You know what's really ironic about all this is, is that the Protestants went so far as to change the, the commandments. You know, you, you, you listen to the modernists today in the modern church, and you see what they do. They think they're going to, to fix everything. So they, they take the, um, the stations of the cross, okay, which have been with us for hundreds of years, and they're going to change them. They, they fix them in their own modernist way. They take the mass, they're going to fix that. They're going to have to start over again because the old Mass is too Catholic, so they have to completely replace it. They take the sacraments, and they're going to mess with those, and they're going to replace them and change them, the ceremonies, and even the, the theology of what they really mean. Okay? For example, with matrimony, uh, all of their annulments are all part of this, changing the very meaning of matrimony as a sacrament. They uh, Just recently, Francis now has changed the, uh, the seven spiritual and corporal works of mercy to reflect ecumenism and environmentalism. That's what the modernists do, see, because uh, they despise the church of the past. So they have to basically fix it up. So they're praising Luther for helping fix up Catholicism and make it even more Catholic. Absurd. Absurd. But one thing that the Protestants did, they wanted to basically um, show their contempt for Catholicism. And so they, they took the commandments and they changed those. Uh, they kept the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have false gods before me. But then they inserted what is actually part of the first commandment in the Bible, Exodus chapter 20, they, they, as though they wanted to make a special point, going out of their way to make a special point, they made a separate commandment out of this, their second commandment, Thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. Now, was this really necessary? No. Was it there before? No. They invented it, they stuck it in there, but they might say, well, it's right there, read Exodus chapter 20, when Moses gave the commandments, he said that. <coughs> and we agree that he said that, Moses said that. But all of that is covered under don't worship false gods. The point that was given to Moses was don't make idols to worship. That's what these graven images were. God said to Moses in saying don't make graven images, don't worship them. God didn't say don't make any statues. In fact, just five chapters later in the book of Exodus, God himself is telling Moses how to decorate the altar in the temple that will eventually be built, and he prescribes making the forms of cherubim and their, with their faces and their wings. And later in the book of Numbers, our Lord even uh, gives the prescription for casting the image of the bronze serpent in the desert. So God does not contradict himself. He says, don't make idols to worship. But he certainly didn't forbid making statues. Just statues. But that's what the Protestants did when they decided to insert a second commandment, pushing what we Catholics know as a second commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, down one and making that their third commandment. Just to make room for the second commandment, thou shalt not make unto thyself any graven image. This was their way of basically sneering at the Catholic Church because of statues in the church. Statues that we, we don't worship. We never worship. No Catholic, no real Catholic would worship a statue, obviously. We end up making an idol. But we have these statues because we have them as representations of the saints. And, uh, I mean, our Lord himself really took flesh. And he really, the Son of God, really became man. So we represent him on the cross. Because there was real flesh there. 
the flesh of God there on the cross. But, of course, it would be totally contrary to the Catholic faith to worship these things. In fact, if you go back into the ages, you find that the Catholic Church was addressing the fact that very few people could read, so she represented her faith graphically in, in the arts and paintings and sculpture and so on to enable people to see, for example, by her stations of the cross and her depiction of the stations to understand graphically like a picture Bible. That's what the churches were, basically. They were basically picture Bibles. That's what was represented on the walls and the ceiling and even on the floor. But I got on this subject because I found it so amazing <laughs> that on the stage with Francis is a statue. And who is it? Who's it of? It's a statue of Martin Luther. A statue of Martin Luther. Francis had two representatives of Lutheranism, two men, one wearing an earring, came up and presented him, Francis, October 13th, in Paul VI audience hall, presented Luther with a gigantic makeup of the 95 theses of Martin Luther and gave that to Francis as a gift. And Francis receives it gratefully. This brazen attack on the Catholic faith. This is the example that this man gives. He's a living, breathing scandal. Certainly no Catholic. Not by any stretch of the imagination. He has nothing but contempt for Catholicism. Real Catholicism. True, traditional Catholicism. What a travesty this is. What a tragedy for those who make the horrible mistake of following him, or trying to follow him. Those who are trying to adhere to the Catholic faith and at the same time trying desperately to somehow follow Francis inevitably are going to have to come to a day of reckoning, a moment of reckoning when they realize that these two things are incompatible. We cannot follow Francis in his faith because it isn't the Catholic faith at all. We have to adhere to the traditional Catholic faith because that is the truth. There is the real Catholic Church. And that is what loving Christ and being faithful to Christ really requires of us right now. Well, God bless you all.